Hi, I'm Sean Rice, and welcome to Gaming Out of Suitcases, RPG Edition. In my last episode, I gave you a rundown of how RPGs work. Now, I wanted to show you the breakdown of one of my absolute favorites, Call of Cthulhu by Chaosium Inc. If you're not familiar with Call of Cthulhu, it is set in a world that is seen through the eyes of the author H.P. Lovecraft. Now, if you're not familiar with H.P. Lovecraft, well, you should be. He's been dubbed the father of modern horror because many TV shows, books, movies, games, even music have been derived from the ideas that he set forth back in the 1920s. The Thing, Evil Dead, Stephen King's The Mist, Alien, Ghostbusters, Cabin in the Woods, Reanimator, countless episodes of Dark Shadows, Night Gallery, Star Trek, Twilight Zone, and Doctor Who, just to name a few. He introduced the idea that many sentient beings and gods live both in our dimension and in others, and saw the human race as some kind of insignificant bug waiting to be squashed by their feet. Most of his protagonists uh, either die or go insane, and there's a feeling of pervading doom that stretches throughout all the stories. One of his most well-known stories is The Call of Cthulhu, which is about the cult of Cthulhu doing all these rites all across the world in order to rise this ancient city out of the ocean. The ancient city had been collapsed many, many years ago and uh, was keeping at bay the ancient god Cthulhu, who was going to uh, kind of take out the human race. Since Lovecraft death, many authors have picked up the torch and continued to add to the stories that surround the world that he created. And they've coined the term Cthulhu Mythos to encompass all of those works. With that being the backdrop for the game, people who play will come in contact with all sorts of occult gods and mythical creatures, as well as regular old human beings uh, who are embedded into the mythos. Now, also remember, the game is set in the 1920s, usually. You can play it whenever you want, but generally the game is set in the 1920s. That's when uh, prohibition and gangsters and segregation and sexism and tedious travel by train and boat were all the rage. With that being said, the game plays like a pulp fiction horror mystery story, with it often being smarter for characters to run away or avoid confrontation with sentient beings. Uh, rather than take them on firsthand. A general storyline usually plays out like this. The characters are drawn into some mysterious happening. The characters set out investigating said mysterious happening, usually through Agatha Christie or Murder, She Wrote methods. Uh, investigation, exploration, interviews, research. The characters come up with a plan to outwit, outlast, stop said mysterious happening. And finally, the characters set out to put their plan into action, while hopefully not dying, going insane, or accidentally causing the end of the world. So, first things first, let's take a look at the kinds of characters you will be playing in Call of Cthulhu. Now, like any role-playing game, you will create these characters from scratch. That way you know exactly how your character will react in certain situations. The role-playing aspect of role-playing games. These games are always more fun when the characters are fully rounded and have strengths and flaws that you can play out. That is where this comes in. It's what you use to break down your character's characteristics, strengths, and flaws into playable statistics that will make more sense when we get to the dice rolling portion of the game. When you start creating your character, it's very important that you are working alongside the other players who are going to be playing in the game, mostly because you're going to be working together as a team, and each one of you is going to fulfill a certain role in that team, and you don't want too many of one thing. For example, if everyone is only good at research and not at fighting, then you're definitely going to die. Conversely, if the team is full of, like, boxers, then they probably won't have a clue of where to even start looking for answers. We're looking for a nice, rounded team. In Call of Cthulhu, it is very wise to have at least one player fall into the following roles. The Charmer. This is the kind of person that can talk their way out of any situation, and they're also pretty good at knowing what to say to make people let their guard down. The Fighter. While combat in this game can be very deadly, it is sometimes unavoidable. So this person is there to help make sure that everyone survives to put the plan in action. And uh, they can also be pretty useful in roughing some people up who can't be charmed. The scholar. The one who knows their way around the library or lab and can probably speak a few different languages. Uh, it's very, very helpful since a lot of the books that contain crucial information in this game come from all corners of the earth and uh, usually are pretty ancient. <laughs> the handyman. The one who through everyday means or uh, ones that are less legal, 
uh, is skilled at driving, picking locks, fixing hinges, unjamming weapons, basically saving the day when everything goes wrong. Once you have a good idea of the role you'll be falling into, then try to think of the kind of people who would fill that role most easily, and keep that in mind as you fill out the character sheet. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about how to roll the dice and come up with all the numbers for the character sheet. Whoever is playing your keeper's role in your game will help you do that when you make your characters. But I am going to go through the character sheet and kind of explain what some of the statistics mean so you'll have a good understanding of the sheet when you take a look at it. The first part of the sheet defines your character's characteristics, each one representing an aspect of that character. Strength. The measure of the investigator's actual physical muscle power. Size. A number that represents the average of the character's both height and weight. Basically how tall, short, thin, squat they are. Dexterity. A measure of the character's physical nimbleness, flexibility, and speed. Constitution. This represents the character's health, vigor, and vitality, and also how resistant they are to poisons and disease. Appearance. Actually refers to both their physical appearance and their personality. Intelligence. How well the investigators learn, remember, analyze information, and solve complex puzzles. Power. This one indicates the character's force of will, also their aptitude for and resistance to magic. Education. Measures the formal and factual knowledge that they possess, and also indicates the length of time that they spent in school. Luck. Um how lucky they are. <laughs> Next, you're going to think of an occupation for your character. Literally anything you can think of that might feasibly fall into the role that you're looking to do. Hobo. Accountant. Cowboy. Secretary. Waitress. Hooker. Judge. Soldier. Journalist. Movie star. Anything. Each occupation is associated with a certain number of skills, which they would be more competent at. The next thing you're going to do is determine how skilled your investigators are at these skills. <laughs> Uh, from 1, not very skilled at all, to 99, the most skilled ever, you'll be given a fixed number of points to assign both to skills associated with your occupation and skills that represent your character's personal interests. Now really think about this when you're assigning those skills. You should be able to justify your choices. Example, a ballerina may be very skilled at horseback riding if she had a horse when she grew up. A gangster very well may be fluent in German if his grandmother spoke German. You get it. Each skill comes with a generic starting percentage, accounting 5%, pilot 1%, and every point you add on to it builds it up from there. The rest of the character sheet is there to help you create a mental image of this character in your mind, letting you to come up with everything from physical descriptions to driving personal beliefs to significant people, places, and things to your character that may come up during the game. Once your character is created, it is time to play. But how does it work? I'll tell you. Generally, what happens is this. The keeper, that's what we call the player who takes on the narrator's role in this game, will describe a situation to your group. Then every player will describe how their character reacts to the situation, role playing out conversations with each other, and sometimes with the keeper himself, as he takes on the roles of all the other characters uh, also known as non-player characters, that they come in contact throughout the game. When you describe something that your character is doing that the Keeper thinks you might not necessarily automatically succeed at, then he will ask you to make a roll or a check. They'll ask you to take a look at a certain characteristic or skill on your character sheet and roll a d100. That's a 100-sided die, though most people tend to roll two d10s, one representing the tens position in the number, and one representing the ones position in the number. If you roll equal to or underneath the percentage listed on your skill or characteristic, then you have successfully completed your task. For example, if my character, Addison Lynch, were trying to talk his way out of a speeding ticket with a cop, then the keeper might ask me to roll a fast talk check. I look at my skill and see I have 28% in fast talk. I roll my 2d10s and... And I succeed. Now, because some checks are harder than others, you'll notice that for each skill or characteristics, there are three boxes with numbers in them. The first or larger box represent the actual points that your character has in that skill, known as a regular success. The top box shows 50% of your base points, representing a hard success, while the bottom box represents 10% of your base points, indicating an extreme success. Confused? Okay, uh, think of it like this. Convincing a cop not to give me a ticket is challenging enough, so the keeper may consider that to be a regular success. My big box, the 28%. Convincing my wife that I'm not cheating on her, even though she's really suspicious of me, is a little bit harder, so the keeper may ask me to roll a hard success. That's the top box. 
14%. Convincing the cops that I had nothing to do with the dead body that I'm standing over and covered in his blood? The keeper would probably think that would be an extreme success. The bottom box, 5%. Okay, so let's say I make my check and I fail. If I can justify in story terms, which is not always possible, I can push the roll or roll again. Though if I push my roll and I fail that, the consequences are going to be way more extreme. Let's use my example from before. If I fail to convince the cop not to give me a ticket, he'd just give me a ticket. If I push the roll and fail, he will not only give me the ticket, but he might think I'm being belligerent and arrest me. Would I roll if I'm lucky enough to roll a one, meaning the lowest I could possibly roll on my skill? It's called a critical success, and something wonderful will happen in addition to what I wanted to accomplish. Maybe the cop doesn't give me the ticket and actually knows where I can find the person that I'm looking for. Now, if I am unfortunate enough to roll between a 96 and 100, it is known as a fumble, where something horrible will happen, in addition to me not doing what I wanted to do. So the cop gives me the ticket and turns out to be a secret member of the cult that I'm running away from. So, are you totally at the mercy of the dice? Not exactly. Remember, you have a skill called luck. You can decrease your luck skill on a one-by-one -one basis, using it to take points away from your roll. For example, let's say I rolled a 33 on my fast talk roll. Remember, I needed to roll a 28. Well, I can take five points away from my luck skill to bring my roll down to 28, making it a success. But remember, when I do this, I'm actually decreasing my luck skill. So if later in the game I have to make a luck roll, it's going to be harder to do. Luck can be recovered at the end of each gaming session, but it comes back ever so slowly. So please use luck sparingly and wisely. Every once in a while in the game, characters will do something Something that opposes each other. Mostly combat, but other things like gambling or pickpocketing, things where one person might want to do something and the other person tries to stop them. Well, the keeper will call for something called an opposing roll, where well, they will both roll dice and they'll look at the level of success to see who succeeds. Now, when opposing rolls are used, the keeper may apply something called bonus dice or penalty dice to give an edge to one of the characters. If you receive a bonus die on your roll, roll two d10s representing the 10s position and pick the lower one, meaning the one that's closer to your success. If you receive a penalty die for your roll, you'll roll two d10s but pick the high your number, meaning you're farther away from your success. This game also uses a really cool mechanic so your characters can kind of change and grow as they experience things throughout the game. When you succeed at a check, when you're not using luck or bonus dice, then you're going to put a little check mark next to that skill. Either at the beginning or the end of the gaming session, depending on how you want to do it, your character gets a chance to grow from their experience. They will roll a d100 for every check mark, and if they roll above the skill, then they get to roll roll a d10 and add that many points to the skill. Pretty cool. And that is pretty much a majority of how the game works. Now there's just two little things I want to cover, and uh, then you'll be ready to go out there and play. First, sanity. One of the mechanics this game uses is your character's sanity. Now as you come across horrors and your character learns things about the world that he thought were not true, then your sanity is going to start to drop. When you come across something that threatens your sanity, the keeper will have you make a sanity check. Now this is like every other check in the game. You'll roll your d100 and try to roll underneath your sanity skill. If you do, then you're pretty much okay. Though some things are really, really horrible to witness, and even if you do make your success, you might have to lose one or two points. If you fail, then he will have you roll uh, another die, could be any number of dice, and you'll lose that many points of sanity. A loss of sanity always causes the investigator to lose control for just a moment. That could be almost anything. They could freeze up, they could call out in fright, they could drop something, they could make an involuntary movement. It's all up to what the keeper wants to happen to you. If you lose five or more points in one roll, <laughs> then you have experienced something fairly traumatic and you go temporarily insane. Going temporarily insane lasts a random number of hours, as determined by the dice. First, you will go into a bout of madness. Now, a bout of madness lasts a random number of minutes, determined by the dice. During the bout of madness, the keeper has two choices. They can either take over your character for the time being, or let you roleplay out how that bout of madness works. Now, the keeper gets to choose from a number of different things. Uh, you could fall into an uncontrollable rage, you could gain a phobia, you could gain a mania. 
Um, you could have amnesia. Uh, something in your background could change permanently uh, for unexplicable reasons. The good news is that during the bout of madness, your mind is so cracked that if you come across anything that gives you more sanity loss, you don't have to take it. Hurrah! Once your bout of madness ends, then the temporary insanity fully sets in. Now during this time you can play your character perfectly normal because, uh, let's face it, sometimes crazy people seem the most sane, at least on the outside. Or you can choose to bring up parts of your bout of madness however you want to roleplay it. Now, the catch is that during the time period of your temporary insanity, if you take any sanity loss whatsoever, you will have another bout of madness. Once your temporary insanity ends, then your character returns back to normal. Until the next time. If your character loses one-fifth or more of their sanity during one day's worth of time in the game, then your character goes indefinitely insane. The effects are pretty much the same as temporary insanity, however, people who are indefinitely insane don't get better, unless they go and check themselves into a sanitarium or seek professional help. Of course, if your sanity ever reaches zero, you go permanently insane. Don't do that. Once you start dropping points, though, don't worry, all is not lost. At the end of every gaming session, you will have a chance to regain some sanity points. You can also regain sanity points throughout the game by uh, killing horrible monsters, thus ridding them from the world, or helping other people cope with their own insanity. Checking into a sanitarium can also help to increase your sanity points. The second thing I want to go over real quick is how combat and your health work. Each character, and monster for that matter, has a set number of hit points. Just like in a video game, if your hit points reach zero, you are either dead or unconscious. See, every once in a while, expect that your character will have to go into battle, either with horrible things from beyond or your everyday human beings. Remember, we're in the 1920s, so uh, aside from horrible cultists, you've got thugs and gangsters running around. Because of the detailed nature of combat, combat gets its own rule set. The first thing to note in combat is how time works. It's a little differently. Now, normally throughout the game, when you describe something your character is doing, it could take almost any amount of time. You could spend half an hour rifling through someone's stuff, or a minute picking a lock, or several hours in a library researching through a book. In combat, however, time slows down, and every action you describe takes about 6 to 10 seconds. Combat is also played in rounds. That way, every character and baddie in the game gets a chance to react to what's going on in the combat situation. First, the keeper is going to decide if anyone is surprised by this combat. Now, you could easily sneak up behind someone and just hit them on the back of the head. That would be a surprise to them. Or you could open the study door and find something there waiting for you. That would be a surprise to you. If the surprise party fails to anticipate the oncoming attack, they have to sit out the first round, which has aptly been named the surprise round. Normally, however, combatants will act in order of their dexterity. Now remember, dexterity is the characteristic that determines how quickly you react. This is how combat works. The keeper will ask each character what they're going to do in that round, and then will immediately describe the reaction of the person or thing that your character is attacking. Then you'll roll some dice to determine the outcome of your action. When it's your turn to act, you can do one of the following things. Initiate an attack on an opponent, either hand-to-hand -hand or with a gun. Two, perform some fancy fighting maneuver. More on this later. Three, cast a spell, if you know any. Four, perform any other action that you can do within the time frame, like picking a lock. Five, <laughs> run away. Okay, so let's say you choose to fight. <laughs> Here's how fighting hand-to-hand -hand works. Now this could mean an actual fist fight or with a, a weapon that's not a gun. Anything that you can pick up to stab, bash, or beat your opponent with. Now fighting hand-to-hand -hand results in one of those opposed die rolls that we talked about. When you choose to fight hand-to-hand, -hand, your opponent has two options. They can either fight back or they can try to dodge out of your way. If they fight back, as most baddies will do, both of you will roll your brawling fight skill, and then we'll look at the level of success that each of you gets. If the attacker gets a higher level of success, or ties. Remember, there's regular, hard, and extreme. Then the attacker strikes their victim successfully and does damage to their HP. If the defender achieves a higher level of success, then they kind of get out of your way and successfully attack you, doing damage to your HP. Now, if the defender chooses to dodge out of the way, you will roll your fight skill, and they will roll their dodge skill. 
and again, we'll look at the level of success. If the attacker achieves the higher level of success, then they attack successfully. However, if the defender achieves a higher level of success or ties, then they've successfully dodged out of the way. Now let's say you wanted to shoot your victim, uh, target. It takes much less time to pull a trigger than to throw a punch. So anyone who has a readied gun at the beginning of a round gets to add 50 to their dexterity score when determining who acts in what order in that round. It's also nearly impossible to fight back against a bullet or to jump out of the way for that matter. So this is not an opposed roll. Only you will be rolling for a gun attack. When you roll, you'll use your firearm skill. What matters here is your distance from your target or your range. Guns will have three different numbers. A short range, a medium range, and a long range. If you're in your short range, then you're going to roll just like normal. If and have a regular success. If you're in the medium range, you'll need to have a hard success. If you're in the long range, then you'll need to have an extreme success to hit your target. Firearm attacks will also generally have either a bonus or penalty of die associated with them. If the thing you're trying to shoot is already in hand-to-hand -hand combat with something, or tries to dive out of the way, or is concealed, or partially concealed, or is really tiny, or is really fast, then you'll probably get some penalty die. However, if you are in point-blank range, like standing right in front of it, uh, then you'll probably get a bonus die. You'll also see that many of the handguns can shoot two or three times during a round. Now, if you only shoot the gun once during that round, then you just play like normal. However, if you're planning to take two or three shots, then you're basically putting speed over aiming, and you'll take a penalty die on every single one that you roll. Plus, firearms have a malfunction rating. So if you roll at usually a 96 or above, <laughs> then your gun jams up. Now let's say you don't want to fight this round, but you want to perform one of those fancy schmancy fighting maneuvers. What do I mean by that? Okay, so what if you want to uh, throw your victim to the ground, or disarm them, or knock something out of their hand, or, I don't know, push them out a window or something? That is called a fighting maneuver, and you're going to attack each other uh, using the same dice you would for hand-to-hand -hand combat, and your opponent gets a chance to either fight back, dodge out of the way, or do a maneuver of their own. When you choose to do a fighting maneuver, though, you have to first look at the builds of the two characters. Why? Well, let's look at this logically. A very small but, like, quick-moving person could probably throw somebody who's very large off their balance, but it's going to be tough. However, no human being is going to be able to overpower and, like, wrestle to the ground some 50-foot monster with seven heads. It's just not going to happen. So, look at the builds of the two characters in question. If um, you are three or more points below their build, nothing you do is going to do any good. Two points below their build, you can make the roll with two penalty die. One point below their build, one penalty die. If you're the same or you have more, you don't get any bonus die, but you don't get any penalty die either. Whenever damage is successfully dealt out, dice will be rolled depending upon what weapon was used to hurt the person or thing and uh, then they will subtract that number of points from their HP. Now this is the cool part. If you rolled an extreme success and you were fighting with a blunt weapon, like uh, your fist or a bat or something, uh, then it's called uh, an extreme hit. And you don't have to roll. You can just give them the amount of damage that is the highest amount that you would have rolled on that dice. If you're fighting with a weapon that pierces, like a gun or a knife, and you roll an extreme success, then it's called impaling that opponent. They take the damage that is the maximum from that dice, plus you get to roll the dice and add that to it. Of course, before any damage is taken, you'll look at the armor that you're wearing, uh, which could be anything in this game from, well, armor, to like a leather jacket or something. Um, and you'll subtract the amount of points that your armor takes away from that damage first. You track all damage on the hit point section of your character sheet. Now, normally when you take damage and you get down to zero, you've just passed out from your wounds. You haven't died. However, when you take damage, if you take one half or more of your entire HP in one hit, well, then you have something called a critical wound. Now, if you get down to zero while having a critical wound, you have the possibility of dying, of bleeding out, if you don't get medical attention right away. And wounds in this game 
heal very slowly. You will get one hit point back for every day that your character does not get hurt again. Um, this, of course, can be sped up with first aid, medicine, or checking yourself into a hospital. And that, my friends, is basically all you need to know to play the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. If you're going to be the Keeper, you can, of course, create your own scenarios in campaigns, but there are also tons of pre-made ones out there that you can purchase either in book form or in PDF form and have right there on your computer when you're running the game. Now, whether you intend on playing as the Keeper or one of the characters, I suggest you check out the Call of Cthulhu RPG book and the Investigator's Hand Guide. Both of these books and other supplements are put out by Chaosium. You can purchase them through drivethroughrpg.com or at the Chaosium website. In point of fact, if you're looking for someone to play with, I am trying to put together a group that meets online through Google Hangouts and plays Call of Cthulhu. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, then shoot me a message and we'll talk. Till next time, stay sane and keep gaming! Role-playing games are the predecessor to video games. Except in role-playing games, you have the freedom to take the storyline any direction you want and solve problems in any creative way that you can think of. I like to think of them as acting-based story games. The players of the game all work together to tell a story where they all play key